Hello and welcome to our webinar today. My name is Jacob Finlay. I'm here with Chris O'Brien. Hey, Chris. Jacob. And we've got a couple special guests we'll introduce in a moment. Our topic today is inflation, shortages, and marketing. And quick disclaimer, what we're going to talk about today is general in nature, general advice. So if you need specific advice to your situation, consult your legal tax accounting consulting or other professional. So before we jump in, we're going to do a quick uh, intro with the pre with the presenters. So Jacob and Chris, Chris is our COO with Full Bay, and then our two special guests, Jimmy Wall, General Manager of Donahue Truck Centers out of California. Hey, Jimmy. Hey, how's it going? Thanks for having me. Jimmy's going to introduce himself uh, here in a bit. And then Luke Todd, president of the service company out of Ohio. Hey, Luke. Hi. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Thanks for being here. And uh, real quick, Jimmy, uh, why don't you tell us about uh, Donahue, what you guys do out there in California? Yeah. So Donahue Truck Centers is in California. We have six locations and uh, we, we work on trucks. We sell parts. We rent trucks. We lease trucks. We sell trucks. Anything to do with trucks, we take care of you. So. Sounds very familiar. Yeah. 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 So <laughs> you guys obviously know your stuff out there. Started in Ventura. Correct. Ventura County. Yes. And then you guys are Central Coast? Yeah, mostly? so Central Coast, based uh, throughout California. We have a location now in north of San Francisco, a uh, location in Bakersfield, uh, Central Coast, and then three locations in Ventura County area where it started. Awesome. We do restoration, like buy and restore vehicles, inside, or like uh, trucks? Um, no, we don't We don't restore. Um, I guess we don't do all things trucks, I guess, right. but uh, we, we uh, no, not really restore. But we do a lot of body swaps. Um, we were talking about that a minute ago, but uh, yeah, well... Because you have the ideal lease franchise out there, right? Correct. Yeah. So we will spec and lease trucks out to a customer's needs of you know how they how they like it, and we take care of all the maintenance. Nice. So yeah. Cool. Great to have you here, Jimmy. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Luke from the service company in Ohio. Luke, why don't you tell us about the service company? <clears throat> sure. So the service company we're uh, based in Dayton, Ohio area. We have uh, three locations there. And we're a lot like that too. We fix everything truck, trailer, uh, cell parts, um, pretty much bumper to bumper on truck, um, even tires, which we used to not do, but we've somehow uh, <laughs> taken on board in today's day and age, sell a lot of parts. Uh, so that's a big part of our, um, our business too. Um, started in 78. So we got what, 43, um, no, yeah, 44 years in it now, so. Hmm. So you must be third generation? For, or <clears throat> my dad started at first generation. I'm second generation. Yeah. So, But we do have some third generation that are scattered in there a little bit. Yeah. Um, working so in the shop. Learning. I knew it was second. Yeah. You know, yeah. You looking our way up Luke, there. Yeah. So, Cool. Yeah. Great to have you here, Luke. You know, and uh, I, I missed this with uh, Jimmy, but, um, you know, what do you do for fun, Luke? Tell, tell uh, I understand you have like a house somewhere special and oh. it keeps you in, you know, tan year round. Well, yeah. So, <laughs> well, I like to, uh, yeah. Hang out with family, obviously do tons of things there. Um, and yeah, we, we go to Puerto Rico in the winter. That's kind of my, I hate winter and I live in Ohio and it's dead and it's cold in the middle of, of the winter and I about can't hack it. So that's the only way I can stay sane. So I get away and go fishing and snorkeling and Jacob's going to teach me how to surf. So. <laughs> uh, you'll be very bad after yeah. I teach you. I'm not that good. That's awesome. You ever log into Full Bay down in... Puerto Rico. All the time. I was yeah. going to yeah, send you a picture of palm trees and toes in the background with a priority <laughs> screen in front of me or something. That's awesome. Jimmy, what do you guys do for fun? Uh, well, personally, I like shooting. So uh, I, I've been building some AR 15s and doing that. That's kind of fun. But I uh, uh, love uh, spending time with my family, um, involved in our church, and um, just wherever we can get an outing, going to a Dodger game, going to a water park, going to the dunes, cool. wherever it might be. It's always just fun to hang out with family. You cool. know, so Awesome. We're going to do a quick polling question now, and it, it so it's going to show up on your screen. And how much has inflation affected your shop? So it's from we aren't seeing any issues. It's difficult, but we are managing as the second option, or it is causing a lot of issues. And we're going to get into that uh, here in a second. But inflation in terms of whether it's tech pay, the price of parts, the price of gas, the uh, utilities, commodities, everything. Um, it's almost like the money supply is going up and yeah. so it costs more money to do things. I, you know, I, I have a storage, just a, a small conversation. I have a storage unit, which I shouldn't have, but uh, my wife reminds me about it like monthly um, when the bill comes. They just raised the rent almost a hundred bucks for that place. And then I have an old scout that's sitting on a, uh, on a lot, just an open lot. And um, that thing just went up. I've been in there since 2004, just storing my trailer and 
So anyway, that thing just went from, uh, I think it's $54 to 85 bucks a month. So it's like everything's gone up. Yeah, I would now, say the my little storage is. Increased so. prices. Um, I'm going to end the poll and then share the results here. So uh, 3% of you are not seeing any issues. It's awesome. Um, 68%, it's difficult, but we're managing. And then 29%, it is causing a lot of issues. So it's a, it's a problem, clearly. Uh, for the for the audience too, so I'll stop sharing that, and we're going to jump into it. So we're going to take the slide down here, and we're going to go full on discussion. And we have a lot of content to cover here. There's no way we'll get through all of it, but hopefully this will be a, a really meaningful discussion. And maybe we start on uh, the inflation issue that we uh, that we just showed up on the screen. So is it affecting you guys, Jimmy? We'll start with you. Sure. I mean, I think inflation is affecting everybody, right? You're, 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 you're paying more for everything and uh, you're having to go to your customers and charge more as well when, when, when you're paying more. So, um, How's that know. going over with the customers? Yeah, I mean, overall, uh, the customers understand. I think there's been some scary situations where we have to come to a customer that maybe is a high volume buyer or they have a, a big project and this time it's you know twice as much or 50% more. But uh, when you have a discussion with them, I, I think they're just open. They understand. They see it in their personal finances, just like you, you shared with the storage unit. I mean, everything's going up. So overall, it hasn't been uh, bad with the communication back and forth, as long as you just communicate and, and, and you know speak to them clearly and be transparent with them. They yeah. understand. Yeah, they're ex experiencing it in other ways, so it's not like you're unique or anything, yeah. right? Yeah. What, Luke, what about you guys? <clears throat> Pretty much the same thing. Yeah. Everything that we touch has went up in cost. And so we're just constantly looking at the expenses and trying to figure out how we can, you know, what we need to absorb and what needs to be passed on, um, you know, fuel surcharges and things along that nature. Um, <clears throat> let's say our fuel costs were up, uh, I think, twice in quarter two, what they were a year ago, mm -hmm. you know, like everybody else. And so just, you know, looking at that and figuring, okay, what we'll do. But like, like Jimmy said, that's everybody's paying it everywhere all the time. I got a, I noticed on our last Verizon uh, bill, there was a, uh, or an, uh, not on the bill, but I got an email that said they, uh, there's an economic adjustment charge that's been added to <laughs> yeah. it, which I thought was, yeah. Yeah. so yeah. it's like, it's such almost like a bandwagon yeah. thing at this right. point. I think yeah. people are just used to it um, because they see it themselves, you know, with the pump and everywhere else. So. It's interesting. You're the first person I've heard uh, fuel surcharge in a long time. And a lot of folks underestimate that, that that's been around. I mean, uh, for, for a long, for a long period of time, the trucking industry uses that uh, It's very common. Um, and if you're in mobile, if, if you have mobile tax, you, you should be adding a fuel surcharge if you're not. And it's, it's almost mandatory at six, seven bucks a gallon. What, what are you guys paying out there uh, per gallon? <clears throat> um, diesel, I think actually I saw something this morning. It was 560. 560. So, yeah, it was over Ohio. six for a little while there, though. So it has come down a little bit. Now, on your fuel surcharge, is it like a, a buck a mile or a, 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 is there a certain rate per mile that <clears throat> you're putting us, on? With us, we just do a set amount. Um, okay. And it's just one one amount per SO that we okay. do. So it just helps cover the cost, all that fuel. Yeah, you know, we're running, getting parts and everything to keep these, you know, try to move these jobs through as fast as possible. And it just helps absorb some of that cost, some additional cost. Yeah. And that's over and above the trip charge, the door to door trip charge and anything yeah. else that's out yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah. And this is mainly this isn't just mobile this is you know in the in the shop too oh in so, the yeah. oh right because you've got all these other expenses of uh, you're right just hustling the, right. the parts etc right that stuff's not it doesn't show up for free correct you're getting fuel surcharges from shippers and other mm -hmm. places you've got to yeah. pass that on yep that makes sense jimmy how about you so we haven't instituted any fuel charges as of yet. There's a competitor of ours that's charging, I think, like a dollar or two dollars in every part you buy from them. Hmm. Uh, we've chosen not to do that yet. We we get a pretty good shop supply markup uh, okay. on our SOs. Uh, we recently raised the percentage on that at the beginning of this year, um, and so we kind of look at our shop supplies as kind of just a grouped in you know cost of all those miscellaneous items that yeah. come. And if we need to raise our shop supply percentage, then we do so. So I think we, we went up like 2% at the beginning of the year. So. On the shop supplies charge? Yeah. As a percentage covering. of 
until of we labor. Would correct. Labor. Okay. You, know, you know, I hate it when you get your cell phone bill or you get your you know utility bill and they have like fifty five surcharges, right. like fifty five cents <laughs> for this, a dollar for that, and you're like, what is half of this stuff? <laughs> right. So I, I want to try to make the billing as simple as possible, and if and just if I just need to raise the shop supplies, I'll do that. Yeah, so. that's definitely one lever to pull. Yeah. When you think about the the cost structure of a shop, um, you mentioned the mileage charge. So really. Th- kind of the essence of the mileage charge usually usually is to recoup the cost of operating like a service truck. If a tech is going out, then also you're charging an hourly charge to recoup the cost of paying a technician to, to drive out to a place. And so I guess a fuel surcharge, like in one sense is just saying we have a mileage charge and it's probably going to be okay in the long term, But in the meantime, we feel like there's a spike in the fuel costs. So we're going to put this surcharge on and eventually it'll come back off or we'll just have to raise the right. per mile fee. Right. Yeah, that was kind of our logic because we discussed it both ways. And the I, we decided in the end that <clears throat> we don't know that fuel's here to stay at this price. And it was an easy thing to do while fuel's up. And if it comes down, we can drop it without having to overall raise, you know, uh, things, which you could do through a variety of different ways. You could do it through, you know, a margin adjustment, through a shop right. supply adjustment. You always go back in and back it down if you need to. But the big thing there, the, the, uh, the big takeaway is that, yes, we're all spending twice as much on the fuels we were last time. The you know somehow you're going to have to pass that on through either labor, mileage, shop supply, or surcharge. And yeah. So with government contracts too, I, I don't know if either of you have them, but um, at uh, the private carrier that we were at, you you couldn't just raise margins. Um, you were locked in, but there were provisions for fuel surcharges. Mm-hmm. So that was one mechanism that even on on the invoices when we shipped uh, food, we were able to add a fuel surcharge uh, uh, instead of changing margin. Yeah. So sometimes you're just depending on the contracts you have, uh, you almost it's the only way to recoup money. Yeah, it kind of goes to the importance of, and I don't know how uh, granular you guys get on the accounting side with understanding the the matching principle, right? Where you want to try to match the cost to the revenue that that cost produced. Um, but the, the, at the end of the day, especially when you're doing like full service leases or any kind of a contract, if you have a cost that's not necessarily accounted for on the revenue side, and then it suddenly spikes and goes up, it can be really hard to uh, to make yourself whole. Like you could start to lose money on a contract. And that's kind of what you're talking about. Like you want to make sure that there's a fuel provision in that or that you've got it accounted for somehow in, in your cost structure otherwise. Yeah, even and I, I like even taking it to the shop supplies. Um, I know we've talked about this. This isn't the financial review, but where you're going is, if you're spending money on shop supplies, towels, solvents, whatever, at the end of the day, you shouldn't be losing money. As those costs are going up, you would have to increase shop supply charges, or start itemizing some of those things if they get too egregious. You know, cans of brake clean. You know, it used to be, you know, you do a brake job and you get two with a brake job. Now I'm seeing it itemized because uh, it's just too expensive. You can't can't get 99 cent brake clean anymore. Um, so, well, the people that do um, accounting on the weekend for the shop for fun, that's what they do for fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, They're probably totally fine because they're just pulling all these levers. But um, for sure, the shops that understand and we see this where when they're looking at their P&L, like they're running their P&L, you've got service truck revenue matched to the cost of operating that service truck, including fuel. So you can quickly see, and the service truck revenue would include mileage and fuel. You can quickly see, are we losing money on running service trucks or not? If, if so, we got to raise rates. And uh, I'm sure you guys have done that analysis, but like any shop that's not keeping track of that is, you should be doing it. And um, there's almost no reason not to because it's, it's a fair exchange of value, right? Like there, you, there's no reason to be the martyr and absorb those costs. And your shop. Yeah. It'll just take three to six months and you'll be wondering how you're going to pay your own electric bill. Well, if you don't straight out of profit. Yeah. Right. It'll just start eroding uh, profit and or um, and then potentially your your nest egg, your savings account if you don't catch it. Yeah. Good old inflation. Well, it's probably a good segue to the tech shortage issue. Right. Do you guys see that uh, in Ohio and Central California? You guys find tax pretty easily? Yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, so, um, 
has this been bad for your shop? Like hard to find tax or what are you guys doing to kind of, and this has been a problem that's been around for years and it's obviously getting worse. Um, Jimmy, why don't you talk about that? Which, sure. How do you guys approach it? So tech shortage is a real issue, right? I mean, I don't, if I think if anyone says they don't have that problem, then, you know, what's the magic pill, right? So <laughs> yeah. um, we, we, we have our ups and downs of tech shortages. Um, some shops um, are good and sometimes we go in um, seasons where we need some. Um, I'm actually in a, in a good situation right now where I've hired literally like three techs in the last week, which is amazing. I, I don't know what happened there. Some <laughs> uh, knock on wood or something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But it, it, it's a real thing. It, it, it definitely is. And we, we have to, you know, stay abreast to that and, and come up with creative ideas for recruiting techs and keeping yeah. the same ones we have. So, yeah. How do you, like in California, I can barely afford to drive there, uh, let alone like a friend of mine, um, when he tells me how much his mortgage is <laughs> and yeah. his power, how, what is the starting wage for somebody? You know, cause if I were a tech there, I'd, I'd feel like I, I don't know, how could I afford to live there and be a tech? Like, do you have to pay a certain threshold or? Yeah. So it's a, it's a very interesting topic. Um, so, um, California has a, uh, a rule that you have to pay twice minimum wage if you require your tech uh, to bring tools. Okay. So uh, minimum wage in California is $100 an hour. No. I'm <laughs> <laughs> like, wait a minute. All right, Jimmy, are you hiring? I think I can now afford to live in California. <laughs> minimum wage is $15 an hour, though, in California. So, okay, so it's um, 30 yeah, if correct. I bring my tools. I, if we require you to bring your tools. So, okay. So um, our tech range hiring is going to be anywhere from, you know, the pay range is probably going to be 20 to $40 an hour, depending on your level. So we don't have to pay $30. So we, we have tool sets and we can supply the tools to them. So it just depends on their experience. Interesting wow. that that's a motivation to provide tools for techs. Do you think that's a pragmatic thing to do anyway, to provide tools? Yeah, so it's something we've been playing around with and experimenting with. So minimum wage has been going up the last three or four years. So if we go back like four years ago, I think it was uh, 10 bucks an hour. So then you really only had to pay your techs 20 bucks an hour that required tools. And then, you know, your journeyman and, and, and whatnot, they're 25 bucks an hour. Well, the minimum wage went up incrementally so much that now it just kind of threw everything out of whack. And so when we're recruiting techs from a car dealership, say, that know how to change oil on a Honda or a Toyota, but they've never touched a truck, it's hard to justify paying someone like that 30, 35 bucks an hour. So supplying tools or having a tool incentive program or, or, or having a toolbox that maybe they own at the end of a certain time frame mm -hmm. is something that we've been playing around with and uh, experimenting with. Yeah. So. Seems like there'd be efficiencies too. I, I haven't find where, um, like I was in a shop in Minnesota and some techs were newer, senior techs had all the tools and had specialty tools and they could get jobs done faster. There'd be a tech, yeah, I'm going to go borrow this tool from that guy. He's going to help me out. I'll get the job done quicker. At some point, I'll buy that tool myself. And I'm, I'm wondering that there's got to be a production and, uh, um, improvement or is, are you seeing any production productivity gains by you having the right tools for these technicians versus them bringing their own and not having the right tools? Sure, I think a tool, you know, you, you bring a saw to cut down a tree, right? You bring a hammer to, you know, <laughs> build a house, but uh, uh, you bring the wrong tool to the job, of course, it's going to take longer. So tool always, you know, has a play in that. Um, but as far as us supplying the right tool, I think from an efficiency and productivity standpoint, a big thing for us is the location of those tools as mm -hmm. well. The shop location of those tools, like the shared like jack stands and yeah. transmission jacks and stuff. If they're at the far end of the shop and you got to walk across there every time to get it, I mean, yeah, you're cutting off a two minutes of your time, but if you do that five times a day, you know, that's 10 minutes times okay. 10 texts. Plus the that's getting out of the zone, right? Getting like out mentally, of the zone. Yeah. And then you stop by another tech and then you have right. chit chat and then you do yeah. these different things. So it's just the whole rule of thumb. You make a tech leave the bay, kiss a quarter hour billable time, goodbye, basically. It yeah. Just is what it is. Every, uh, you know, what the shop that we ended up building at uh, Shamrock when I was doing the f uh, fleet, um, we at every other bay, we had the tools and um, the lines were painted out where the jack stands went yeah. so that they always got returned. And it was very nice that you knew where you were going to get your jack stand or you knew where the jack, the actual tranny jack was. Um, cause they're big piece of equipment. You need them close, but you also need them where they're supposed to be. Um, and then we ran the shop like a little shop scrubber, just bought one. It's easier to run it every night keep the shop floor clean. Yeah, absolutely. Even mop buckets. We tape out where the mop bucket goes. There you go. Yeah. You don't want to spend five minutes looking for a mop <laughs> to clean your bay, you know? Yeah. So. What, what about you, Luke? What do you guys do for the tech shortage? Um, we try to hire experienced techs, but like everybody, it's 
there's not enough technicians out there for the amount of trucks that are broken down on the road. And right. so um, we do, you know, we, we try referrals, you know, I always put a message out to everyone when we are hiring the, Hey, you know, um, you know, we're looking for somebody at this branch for this position doesn't need to be technician, but, um, and, uh, try to, those seem to be pretty good, um, pretty good, uh, success rate there as far as the quality of, of the people. Um, we also have started recently about a year ago we started what we call a trainee program and so with toolboxes we supply to them and after a certain amount of time they become their box um are you doing um, that with anybody or is that all in-house um that's all in-house okay. so we have one person that uh, monitors uh for trainees right now and he's a seasoned tech and so he's uh able to, you know, um, help them with just, you know, and they're not doing advanced things yet, but, you know, making sure that when they do a PM that they are doing it, you know, they do have their eyes open. They are seeing what they, you know, what needs to be uh, there. And this, you know, how it is being a tech, there's all kinds of little tricks to the trade, you know, a, you know, doing a wheel sealer or, or a brake mm-hmm. job and just helping them with the struggles and showing them how to, in our area, use the torch. Yeah. Rusty, rusty bars. Right. That's right. And so, um, so anyway, that seems, um, we, the jury's still out on that, but I think long term, that's where we're going to have to be because right. there's just not enough. There's, there's not enough people doing this to just everybody be stealing each other all the time. And so we're hoping to maybe, you know, be able to have a, some sort of program there where we can, you know, um, feed techs into the shops that are able to, to stay up to, you know, and plus, you know, they're learning to do things the way that, you know, that we want to do them Mm -hmm. and so on. So, yeah. And is the, the wage in, uh, in your market, is it in the 20s, 30s, or? Ex- um, starting off, those techs are in that 20 range. Um, and then, yeah, our experienced techs are in that $40 range. All right. so, so that yeah. is the zip code. Plus overtime. So, what's that? A lot of overtime. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, as much as I can get them to work. Yeah, uh, oh, yeah wow. of course. There's, uh, there's just, there's always trucks to fix, yeah. well, and there's said, always a customer needs to go, and so. You said it, that ratio, and that's probably something that we should dig into in our next annual report, but um, the ratio of, trucks on the road to technicians available to maintain trucks. Um, I imagine that is just widening and uh, in a world where poorly maintained trucks, like create a hazard on the roads for us, like our families are sharing the roads with these things um, almost becomes a public safety thing. And I think that maybe at the macro level, this whole concept of the shortage is it's not good, but um, it does highlight the fact that both of you and anybody that's able to maintain uh, like this cadre of technicians in a group at, in a business that is executing on maintenance and repairs is increasingly special and rare and very needed by the fleets. Like they need you guys to not just stay in business, but thrive. They need you to stick around because what are they going to do, right? They're, are they going to try to build this internally? Uh, it's going to be that much harder for them to do it because there's no profit incentive and so forth. So. I think that just underlies the whole concept of what we were talking earlier on inflation, on the cost structure and everything. Don't feel bad about recouping the cost that you are incurring to keep this thing alive, plus a reasonable margin, uh, because your customers are not going to complain. Like any reasonable customer is not going to complain about that. So don't hesitate to do it. You have to thrive in business. We all need you to be around for our public safety and the fleets need you too. Yeah. When you say Chris. Yeah. And then I, I'm a big fan of quality. You know, it's one, if you pay a little bit more and you don't have to go back and or it's done right the first time, kind of, we were talking about this earlier, if you want it done right, do it yourself. Or uh, I think you had a great quote about um, going fast and uh, going yeah. together. But yeah, I think that there's a quality component too. Um, cause I, I guess at the end of the day, the fleets need uptime and it's money every, every, you know, every time a truck wasn't available, we had to go lease and, or we couldn't service an account. And it was a far, um, I mean, the, the millions of dollars at stake in the business we were in was, I mean, it was, it didn't matter what we paid for repairs at certain point. <laughs> yeah. And that's kind of why we like focused the thesis early on. Uh, in the beginnings of Full Bay was to focus on commercial repair specifically because these issues exist on the commercial re- repair almost exclusively versus like retail repair shops and so forth. So like to the extent that we can build tools to solve problems that you guys are running into in the B2B business to business repair space where you're taking care of fleets versus just people off off the street, I think there's a real um, need there. So that's why, you know, we pretty much don't sell full bay to shops that don't take care of fleets um, because of that. So anyway, I think 
it's an interesting situation. So while we have a tech shortage, um, you guys are obviously being creative in addressing it and you're going to come up with even more solutions in the future is because it's not getting any better necessarily uh, with the with the skills gap and so forth. So anyway, exciting times. Yeah, I always liked getting the parts discount. <laughs> so working around a couple of guys like you, you'd be like, oh, I need a turbo. Oh, yeah. don't worry about that. We got those. Uh, so it's, uh, there's always fringe benefits for the folks that uh, work in the mechanic shops. <laughs> yeah, yeah, true. Um, so how about the parts shortage? <laughs> I hate the part shortage. Look, it's, it's, a great, I mean, it's a great industry. It's causing inflation, so right? Things, Supply and demand. <laughs> so many good things. I mean, you guys, uh, it, it, that's what's amazing about the commercial repair industry, fleet repair industry, is you guys are so crucial to society functioning. And yet it's like this hidden thing. Like, do you ever find yourself having to explain to people what you do and how it's not where you would take your car in to be repaired and so forth? Yeah, I was talking to my wife the other day and telling her about this, and I'm like, oh, trying to explain to her what we do, and I don't <laughs> yeah. even know if you're really going to care what we talk about. Cause, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's crucial. And uh, so anyway, um, so there's a lot of positives about, about what's going on, even though it is hidden, and we're working uh, to try to raise, raise the profile in the industry, and I think that helps maybe bring more entrance in, and to the extent that you guys execute and are able to pay tax more and more, that will also attract new body, new blood into the industry on the technician side. But, but there is a part shortage as well, yeah. right? It's kind of an echo of COVID and a lot of reliance on just-in-time inventory and the supply chain, chain interruptions. So um, we had this well oiled machine running, COVID hits, and suddenly the global supply chain is out of whack. Um, issue for you guys, not an issue. Luke, you guys... You guys okay? <clears throat> no, we're we're struggling with it, <clears throat> like everybody like everybody else is. Um, especially, um, you know, we've got trucks that are down in the shop on the lot that we're just yeah, or running around, running up and down the road because we honestly can't get the parts, and it's just like don't take it apart, just run it, keep an eye on it, um, and we'll let you know when the stuff comes in. Um, if they say four weeks, it's going to be six, which turns into eight, which turns into 12. So don't plan on it. And <laughs> These I mean, are non DOT issues. So you don't correct. have to take it down. Yeah. But sometimes you do. It's some, yeah. I mean, it could be it's like literally overhaul kits are, are really hard to get right now. Um, you're piecing together engines with different suppliers, which is not the greatest thing to do, but your options are either shut the truck down or, you know, that. So well, yeah, we have guys running around checking the oil, you know, and that because they, you know, the parts are on order, but, um, um, you know, they're not, you know, they're not will be in anytime soon. So what's the craziest thing you've done to get parts? What's like, just, you've never thought in a million years you would do it. Well, <laughs> I really didn't think of anything myself, but I asked, uh, Zeb, he's like, Oh, <laughs> He starts coming yeah, up with that. Guy. Yeah. yeah. He's like, uh, he said, I was under, con he said, I ordered a bunch of seats that we had in stock to sell. And the vendor, Dr. Vendor, and give us display models. And he said, it was a contract. We weren't able to sell these seats. He said, but they couldn't give them to me. He said, so I unbolted the, the base mount, sold all the seats out and everything. And so um, he also said that, yeah, like, uh, needing parts for for trucks they had it at a dealer he was going out of state to a family reunion talked to his bro uh, brother-in-law into meeting him at the family reunion with these parts because he was in the same <laughs> state as where the dealer was nice. <laughs> and nice. so yeah there you just go. things like that just being creative to try to get these parts in to, yeah. uh, to make it happen so we just put a couple containers <clears throat> in uh, storage containers at the one shop just because um which that's kind of a little bit off topic but the uh, the shortage um if you see the stuff available, the parts available, you don't know when they're going to be available again. Right. So you stock up. Because uh, you're seeing that. It's yeah. available, and then suddenly it's gone. It's gone, gone. Yeah. yeah. You know, all of a sudden, you, you want brake drums, and nobody's got brake drums. All of a sudden, you know, you find out, hey, there's 10 skids available here. You buy all 10. And Do so you think you, some of that is people doing what you're doing? Exactly Filling what a it is. Yeah. 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 And so if we were all nice, we would all say, you know, well, I think I can use this many. over. But the reality of it is, is somebody's going to snatch all these things up, and then they're going to supply their customers. Um, and so it's really hard to, it doesn't help with the situation, um, there, but anyway, it, it is the reality of part shortages when, uh, you know, D13 water pumps become available buy them all because you can't get your hands on them any other time, which is risky because that takes working capital. It does. Right? Our yeah. inventory values are not where we would like them at right, right now, but it's that or run out of parts. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so how about you, Jimmy? 
I have a trailer load of toilet paper if people are still looking for toilet paper. <laughs> <laughs> now, I remember when toilet paper ran out. Or yeah, or exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Two ply, one ply. Yeah. Um, you know, same thing. It's funny that you said seats because uh, the craziest thing, it, this isn't the craziest thing we've done, but seats. It's like we can't get seats. It's like... <laughs> Wait, it's like a cushion and like some thread. <laughs> I mean, I'm probably oversimplifying <laughs> yeah. it, right? right? But I challenged my whole team. I was like, call your grandma, call whoever you need to, find someone that can sew these things and put these <laughs> things back together because we couldn't get them. <laughs> it's we literally have... just the upholstery, not the steel or anything. I think it's, I the, don't, f- I think it's the foam. I don't know. I, but yeah. You know, I don't know. That's huh. just what I hear. So, so I found someone that will sew seats. It's not my grandma, even though I almost found like my mom's <laughs> like friends, like. Right. But uh, we found someone that can upholster seats, which solved that problem. But um, you know, we're getting creative too. We just bought five trailer loads full of DEF. Um, I mean, that's oh, wow. a huge capital investment. Right. Talking about capital investment, but it, it either runs out or the next time you go to order it, it's two or three dollars more. Right. Um, you know, per unit, and so. Um, luckily we have the storage capacity because five trailer loads, literally five yeah. big, you know, 50 foot. Th- uh, and is that for resale or are you consuming that? Uh, well, n- probably 99% of it we're reselling. reselling. Right? So okay. we have our lease and rental fleet right. okay. that we, we may use on our rental trucks here and there, but we're charging a customer for that too right. if right. they don't return it. So okay. it's, we're selling a hundred percent of it. Mm-hmm. So, wow. yeah. Um, yeah, it's crazy. I mean, we, we've traveled four hours to get apart. Um, we, we almost traveled to Nevada, which is far from us in California to go get apart. And so it's just, just thinking outside of the box, trying to locate parts or buy extra of it or, um, you know, find your grandma to reupholster a seat. <laughs> <laughs> and are you re, I mean, if you have to travel to Nevada for a part, are you recouping the cost of that or just absorbing it for the, for goodwill purposes? I think it would depend. Again, we're a lease and rental fleet. So if it's on our lease fleet, um, that it, becomes yeah. a very critical priority. Yeah. Not that our retail is not priority, but like when the lease truck goes down, we have to do whatever it takes and we wouldn't build a customer for that. If it's a retail deal, yeah, we would, we would probably give them some alternatives. Hey, your truck's going to be down for three months. Or, you know, hey, <laughs> for we an extra thousand bucks or 500 bucks yeah. or whatever it might be, we can get it. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm still waiting for my oil pan, and uh, I got lucky. I have a cam without lifters for about two months, and then a guy called me and found my lifters. So I'm caught up, and I haven't made it to finding the grandma stitching seats yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I have found an outlet, just so you know. Uh, this, this will be where it all, like, solidifies here. So uh, through uh, our sales rep, his uh, father is the dentist at a prison, and um, through that whole network, they will reupholster. <laughs> okay. yeah. So the prison, you can send stuff to the prison and they'll reupholster it. And I said, well, what's the, you know, the lead time on this? And do you, do you get it back? And, and it's not like they're trying to smuggle anything out of the prison. So you don't have to include some stuff in the seat. When you <laughs> no, send it. you don't. <laughs> but yeah, you send it over. And if you don't need it for a while, you can get them to reupholster your, like, your, your vehicle or your seat. Let Bostrom know that. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure. <laughs> well. So yeah, they got all the material. I think if you supply, depending on what you give them, it speeds up the process. But you're still probably four to eight weeks or more. But anyway, uh-huh. yeah, uh-huh. Found interesting. That the other day. Yeah. Interesting. Um, so, what about the customers? Are you guys uh, scrambling to find customers? You mentioned there's more trucks needing repair than technicians to repair them. What what does that landscape look like for you? And are you looking to bring in new customers right now, Luke? That's a that's a good question. It's something we talk about actually quite a bit at our company. Um, yes, the answer is yes. Of course, if if we have opportunity for more customers, we're going to more than likely take those on and and somehow find some way to service them. Um, to actively go out and try to find customers, that's probably one thing that we currently kind of keep the brakes on somewhat, mm-hmm. um, just because the technician shortage um, is is real and to overpromise to say, Hey, you need to come to us because we're the you know, greatest thing since sliced bread. And then they come in and we say, Oh, we're three weeks out, you know, as is, is not, better. yeah, it feels like, better if they find you versus you actively going that, out. That is true. Out. Now, that being said, we do do some sales efforts, but we are somewhat pretty focused on what we're trying to get accomplished there. Um, just because it helps, you know, some other areas of the company that we're, that we're working on expanding. And so, but yeah. from that service end of it there, it's just, it's a really, 
you can get yourself in a bind and the customer in a bind too, um, really quick if you don't have a solid, you know, the the capacity to be able to actually do the work that you're out there selling. That's just our stance on it right See, now. It's the same way, Jimmy. Yeah, um, we're we're seeking to get customers. We just recently created a new role. We have a sales manager. We we're hiring account managers that go out and seek business. Um, we've we found that being in the lease and rental industry, preventative maintenance is a key to our business model. Um, so the simplicity of oil changes and what we call an annual inspection in California is a bit inspection. Just doing those, doing the trans services, doing the preventative maintenance. Um, we find a huge success and you don't have to have, you know, a $40 an hour, you know, 20 year veteran technician to do those as well. So we're finding success in that. Um, but then it is a challenge when you have the heavier duty repairs that need to be done and, and, uh, and whatnot, but we're seeking new customers. Absolutely. We're, we're in growth mode. Are you proactively tracking the PMs like the like Absolutely. the bit and the, yeah. the wet service and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's a challenge in, in many areas. We could talk about this for hours, but um, yes, we're tracking services. Um, we're taking it to the level where we, we were trying to tell the customer, you don't need to worry about this. We'll, we'll take care of you. Yeah. We'll tell you when it's due. We'll contact you. As a we'll, value add. So you kind of having the, uh, the weight on your shoulders to track the PMs on their behalf so they can basically delegate it to you, that feels like a huge value add. Absolutely. One of the initiatives are account managers that go seek new business is find an account that's got, you know, it doesn't matter if they have one truck or 10 trucks or 20 trucks and, and set them up on the portal, the full bay portal. Let's set them up. Let's get their VIN numbers. Let's set up all their um, intervals of what they're tracking their stuff at. And let's add that value. And, uh, you know, you get that and they come in for that. Then you get the other repairs, you get other, yeah. you know, residual business that comes out of that. You want to be the only ones touching the truck. Ideally, do you do you see it as a viable thing to charge for that? Not just for this oil change itself, but charge for hey, we're going to provide the service proactively tracking your PMs, uh, so you don't have to worry about it. Instead of that being almost like a loss leader, having that be something that you almost like a monthly subscription or something like that, charge for. Is that viable or? Absolutely. So a couple thoughts on that. One is uh, if they really want to go full board, that's when we do the full service leasing and take over the whole asset. Or you one. provide the asset. Correct. Yeah. But if you just want to own your asset and you just want a retail shop and a partner that you come to, um, you know, there's the simplicity of maybe like a portal where you, you they pay for a subscription of some sort of value they get. Or, um, you know, you can get all the way down to a subscription model to where, you know, you, you we don't even do business with you unless you subscribe to us and you pay a monthly fee. And in exchange for that, maybe there's a level or two, maybe three levels and it gets you better, quicker access to the bays for unscheduled downtime, maybe a favorable labor rate, yeah, stuff like that. Absolutely. And we're doing business with businesses that absolutely want to do business with us. And so that, that uh, quality of our service and the quality of the customer is enhanced yeah. because they have some teeth in the game. They're paying, they're paying something for this. Right. So they want to get something on that monthly, you know, subscription. Yeah. If I'm paying for, you know, Netflix or Amazon and I'm never watching movies, then I'm going to cancel my subscription. But if I'm paying for it, I'm going to make sure I'm watching some shows, you know? So, right. Yeah. And they need you. Yeah. And so it's not like a, a nice to have, maybe we'll watch Netflix. It's yeah. I need it to run my business and to generate revenue. I need, I need the, you know, Donahue to take care of my trucks or I'm, you know, in a really bad place. Yeah. So. With the, uh, with inflation, part shortage, et cetera, do either of you find that people are shying away from um, proactive maintenance or preventative maintenance? Do they, say, hey, just look for the basics or only DOT, don't go over this with a fine tooth comb or are Maybe people like shying away? I have uh, not hands. experienced that yet. <clears throat> it seems like everybody, um, as always, the biggest constraint is the amount of time that they're allow allowing it to stay in the shop Got to have it. the work okay. done. And so if you can, <clears throat> if it's not broken and it's due, totally do it. But if you can't get it done in the time frame that I want, which is about thirty seconds, then please don't right. please don't disable it. Yeah, Keep it moving. Yeah. So if it's non DOT. Don't disable. Order the parts. Get it ready. We'll bring right, it back. Exactly. But they're not like shying away from programs or cutting corners or anything. It, it, it is more difficult because we manage a shop and workflow differently than we did three years ago because we have more trucks that are on the road waiting for parts or the parts have arrived. Now we're trying to call the customer like, hey, you need to bring your truck back. We got that belt in or we got that whatever. And we're having to call them repeatedly. Um, and so that's a challenge. It's a whole new workflow. You're not just managing what's in the shop. Now you're managing these, you know, mm -hmm. 
um, schedule back in type drugs. Yeah. So now, do you have deposits on that or partial payments, it or depends. are you at risk with those it, orders? I think it depends. I mean, of course, if it's a customer we don't know, yeah, we're pre prepaid and whatnot. But a lot of our customers we have relationships with; they're local community businesses, and we've done business with them for years. So it just depends on the customer and the the part. If I'm ordering an engine. Uh, no matter probably who the customer is, I'm usually getting some type of deposit on that uh, high level uh, part. Now, are you both doing in frames? You, you just said engines. Are you going deep repairs? You'll do an in frame right in the shop. No, that doesn't get subbed out. Yeah, just, we, just machine work gets subbed out. Otherwise, you'll take it all the way down. Yeah, and we'll do a light together. bulb to an engine and even tires, like you said. Yeah, right. tires right. are awesome. Wow. Yeah. What do you guys think is the ideal customer? What profile of business? I mean, obviously somebody with integrity who pays, yeah. but what profile of fleet is the ideal? Uh, <clears throat> for us, it would be the customer that has trucks that are probably doesn't have their own shop. Um, otherwise, they're only going to sub out to you the really hard things that they can't do, yeah. um, which is fine, except for you only have a very small percentage of your workforce that can really effectively help them out in those situations. Um, <clears throat> a shop or a customer that has uh, doesn't have their own shop. I pref I actually like customers that have trucks as a necessary evil, not as their main business. So they're not necessarily in the trucking business. Right. They just own trucks because they need to do other work. Like haul their them. own product exactly. around. Exactly. Factories. Or yep. Uh, farming um, is a little bit like that. Um, and so it's like, you know, this is just a necessary evil to the operation. I have to own this to, to make this work. Um, so anyway, that's for us, that's kind of our, our ideal customer. Yeah. They tend to have bigger budgets. They're not making money off the truck itself mm -hmm. and dealing with super razor thin margins. Yeah. And they're looking at the truck from like a business perspective rather than like a um, maybe... Um, hobby perspective or, or, or whatever you know they this is um it's an expense give me the numbers let's make it let's make it happen because this is just one of 100 things i gotta make a decision on today do i put an engine in the truck do we replace this piece of equipment and what am i going to do with this you know machine that's stuck in shanghai when it's supposed to go to tokyo you know yeah. those are the kind of customers it's like you know what we're just one little piece of this we'll do a really good job with that end of it and uh so anyway but that's that's okay. just us but all customers are valuable. I mean, yeah, they, sure, they absolutely. Have, but those are those would be ideal, I would say. What do you think, Jimmy? Yeah, um, you know, kind of back to that subscription model. Just thinking about wanting to do business with the business that wants to do business with me. You know, um, not all businesses seek out to do business with you because they like you. They it's a uh, they have to because their trucks down. But a local business that's local, implanted in the community, and uh, again, if the truck is more of a tool rather than the livelihood of their business, like a trucking company, right? A trucking company, a truck goes down, like they don't have a store or salespeople, like the truck is their business. Um, the, we'll work on those, but the local community type companies are easier to deal with. I, I, I like key throwers, what I would call someone that throws a key and says, just get it done, <laughs> whatever it needs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Key> <laughs> thrower. Yeah, you know, right. I don't even need an estimate. I trust you. High like, trust relationship. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah. those are right. awesome. The ones that want to nitpick yeah. everything and like, they you know, want to, bring you down $10 here and there. It's like, okay, we have those, but those just, they don't see the value in what we provide. They're just trying to save a buck, but key throwers is what I want. So the, uh, you know, that's funny. I got one for you uh, in Texas. This old boy told me that um, it's a, there's a toe tapper. He does not like toe tappers. I said, okay. what the hell is that? He said, they're just, they're impatient, just tapping their oh. toe, uh, waiting for you to get the work done. So key thrower and toe, toe tapper. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> we could come up with like a book of like lingo. Like, exactly. like, like uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, so you're doing some work to find customers, but you, you don't want to overpromise because of the capacity to deliver and you want to take care of your existing customers. Do you, do you guys have a website that you use, uh, whether to attract customers or to make it, ex make yourself accessible to existing customers? Do you, do you guys run a website? Yes. Yeah. So we, we have a website. We recently revamped it, uh, I don't know, a year or two ago. And, uh, it, it, it's so much better. Um, we're going to get ready to go through a whole new revamp and simplify it. Yeah. So we built our website with like all of this information and then we realized, okay, from a marketing standpoint, you kind of need some simplicity to Cause what's the goal, right? Yeah. With the website. Exactly. So yeah. yes, we have a website and yeah, it, 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 it's a great tool um, for us. 
you guys, I think, too, same concept. And you guys are selling yeah. parts on your website. Um, or you, well, you that's a different, yeah, different but yeah, 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 we do have a an e commerce site also, but um, our our main um, service company site is, um, uh, yeah. I, I redesigned it a couple of years ago um, just because it looked like it was made in 2007 by like a brochure ad, which mm. it was. Uh, <laughs> and so, uh, but we just recently went with Dieselmatics and did the whole nine yards oh, there. Cool. Great so, choice. yeah, Great um, choice. back, uh, that was in May. So we're pretty fresh on that. But uh, basically, when it comes to that sort of work, we just don't have the in house capability to design and, and manage it. And so, um, we went that yeah we went that route just because we wanted it clean we wanted it reportable we wanted it to be um, change basically I wanted it to be fluid with whatever was going on at the moment and so so yeah that's where and and it's it's working we're getting a lot of a lot of traffic off of it so oh so like uh, it optimized like uh, SEO Even, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, you immediately saw gains from that it, change? I, well, maybe not immediately, but almost. I mean, we've only yeah. been live since May and we're only okay. in July, but I've noticed this month is about double what it was last month traffic wise. And, and we're only halfway, I mean, halfway through the month. Wow. So projected yeah. through the month will be twice what our June visits were. So, yeah, interesting. So, so with a website, what is the way you see it? What is the goal of having a website out there? Like, why would you even have one? Or maybe two or three goals. What's the primary goal? What's the secondary? Goal? For myself, I I will always go to a website and try to get the information that I need before I start, you know, calling and stopping in somewhere. So, I mean, it's just to me anybody that's researching anything that has to do with with trucks in our area, I can't imagine why you wouldn't be online looking for look, looking for it. And so, I feel like we need to have a good presence there, just because this is. I mean, I'm not unusual. Everybody's like that. Everybody goes online, tries to find out, um, you know, who around them does that, does a service. As far as informational, there'll be some um, some good data in there that might be able to help a customer out. Um, but primarily for me, it's just that if somebody wants to research us, they have the ability to do that online um, without this, having to just call and say, hey, do you guys, you know, fix trucks? So this is a potential... <laughs> so, <laughs> This is a potential customer that would come in maybe as a walk and repair, but not wouldn't wouldn't necessarily be somebody that you would take over the fleet, you know, PM tracking for or fleet maintenance for. Yeah, yeah, that, Mostly that's for right. a walking yeah. customer. Yeah, I get a lot. I mean, we get a lot of inquiries from people that are just you know, yeah, hey, I have six trucks even, and we're looking for a new provider, and I saw you guys are in our area, you know, yeah. and so fill out a form, and we reach back out, and like I said, we don't actively go find customers, but if we get one of those forms, if they yeah. come to you. Oh yeah, we're gonna yeah. be all over that. That's so. almost better because it's passive, and if you can make yourself found, they come to you. Then you're not in a position where you've over over promised but can't deliver. Um, but you still have traffic it's still coming in coming that you can in. pick through. Yeah. We just, I don't know, we don't know 100% of everything. So we're, we, you know, we're learning our way through it, but um, we just decided to put dollars into marketing because we feel like that is where people are actively search, searching yeah. and they will come to us more than likely through that as long as now the challenge is when, the, when, the, when you make the initial contact, uh, when, the, you know, when the form submission comes in or when the phone call comes in, yeah. that you've trained the staff to be able to, to, to handle the call and not be just so wigged out about the other hundred trucks on a lot. That, you right. know, so, and that's what's cool about Dieselmatics. Every call coming in is all being monitored. It's all recorded. So you're able to review those and then go back and, and make decisions off of that, or at least, you know, maybe train a little bit better or, or at least, you know, send out, you know, reminders that, Hey, reminder, if a guy calls in for this, we can't do that at this branch or whatever. So, yeah. Is, is it the same thing for you guys, Jimmy? Yeah. So a website for me is informational one. That's what our website traditionally has been. But I think uh, also, I think it's like a drip campaign. I think it's something that you want to give customers uh, something of value. Uh, whether it's an ebook or a blog or a landing page or, 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 or something that they can go there and consume some content, but it, it, it's, it's enough to entice them to continue to come get content, but they eventually want the real thing, <laughs> right? Yeah. So, and what is the real thing? Well, the real is thing is it a one time repair or the relationship? Like that's the, the relationship like the for PM us. Relationship. Again, back to that customer, like I want a relationship at Key Thrower, I want someone that is is that I'm going to continue to do business with nothing against the one time customer. Absolutely. We want those too. But I think long term for our success, it's it's that long term customer relationship. Yeah, yeah it's uh, obviously it's something we've discussed a lot. And we just acquired Dieselmatic. We, we had our own website offering, but we really liked what they were doing. And 
it's an interesting situation because you do have in a way more customers than capacity to execute. And yet we are talking about like the ideal customer, like ideally your entire book of business is the key throwers, right? And so it's almost like a function of, well, how can we like maximize whatever capacity we have, make sure it's totally utilized and it's full of the key throwers. And exactly. so when somebody goes to a website, the way I typically think of it, like for full day, somebody comes to our website, we want them to request a demo because once we demo them, there's a high likelihood that they're going to sign up and use the software. And so that's the whole point is to drive people there. Um, but then we also have a login button, you know, so our existing customers can come and log into the app and so forth. So it's helpful that way as well. But the primary purpose is to make sure that people can find us in an inbound motion. And we pay for, you know, paid ads and so forth. But we also get a lot of inbound organic traffic just off of like ebooks and organic stuff like you mentioned. Um, so for a shop, it's a little bit different because it's not a matter of like requesting a demo of software. Um, a lot of the websites that we've built, they'll have a repair request button. That's like the big, like when you go to a website, uh, I'm, I'm in the market for a kitchen table. We just moved into a new house. We have eight kids and we're trying to get a big round table. We were in Amish country a few years ago and mm -hmm. eating around this table and realized this is what we want, round table. <laughs> and uh, I was on a website and King they have, no, yeah. Yeah. King they have all these pictures of tables, but there's no call to action. Like yeah. I just want to call order to a table, right? Yeah. So somebody coming to your website, maybe they just want to request repair and maybe they become a one-time walk-in customer, but also maybe they want you to come help them evaluate their fleet and they're willing to give you a list of their units and so forth. So how do you guys think about that kind of dichotomy between we kind of want to get them in the door for, for a service request, but we also ultimately want them to become the key thrower. How do you, how do you think about that in terms of what you would put on a website? I think that's absolutely necessary. And that's what we're starting to work on is, hey, let's evaluate your fleet. Um, let us um, put a safety program together for you. Um, would you like a white paper on, you know, uh, driver shortages or fuel costs or whatever? Right. Um, just just bringing value, whether it's an in-person meeting, whether it's uh, sending them an email or some document right. uh, or a phone call, because that generates the lead, which then starts the relationship. And then from there, you know, we, you build on that, of course. So, so that's a situation where an inbound motion where you haven't necessarily like sought them out. So there's not some expectation that you're going to immediately give them a bunch of stuff. They sought you out. But then if they're asking for an evaluation, then you can put the account manager on it and say, hey, look, here's the situation. We don't have a ton, ton, ton of capacity, but here's what we provide. And if you like this, then we could work something out and potentially get you in. Um, so it almost creates the scarcity or show it, it reflects the scarcity that already exists and gives you an opportunity to kind of, I wouldn't say like have the upper hand, but um, you get them in the door, you wanted them in the door and you attracted them through a good site and some paid tactics, some organic stuff. Um, but they're still, they want you more than necessarily you want them maybe. Yeah. I don't know if this is making any sense. Yeah, no, it makes I, sense. I, we looked at our Google Analytics, and we have some blogs on there and stuff that talk about, like, do you need a commercial driver's license to operate a truck, right? Yeah. And we have a few of these blogs, and when you look at the analytics of all our pages and everything, those blogs have thousands of more, you know, hits and visits yeah. and, and, and landings and stuff than the, you know, we offer services. We're an Allison dealer. We're a Hino dealer. We're this, we're that, right. we're this. Right. And it's like they just want that content that they want to read because they're seeking out an answer to a question. Right. And they want to be educated and get the answer. And then, oh, wow, you, you provided value to me now. Right. Now, wow, what else can you provide for me? Oh, I have a truck that just broke down. I'm going to call Jimmy at Donahue, you know. So yeah, it's the yeah. long tail. That's and that's where right. my my like thinking of a fleet is. Do I need a CDL? What what C is a Class B or Class A? Yeah. Uh, can I run triples in my state or doubles? Or even if you um, like even took it to um, here's what here's what it costs to operate a fleet without a preventive preventative maintenance program. Here's one with a preventative maintenance program. Um, here's one that was being ran that they thought they had one. We took it over and here's where it's at, like showing cost reductions, showing impact to your point. I just saw the clock. <laughs> We're out of time. <laughs> Pretty much out of time. We're going to throw a slide back up and ask, um, basically, we were talking about Full Bay. Um, so obviously, we built Full Bay as software to run a better and more profitable business for a commercial repair shop. And um, so if you would like to have a demo of Full Bay, um, we're going to pop up a, a polling question here. Just let us know yes uh, if you do, and we'll reach back out to you. 
And um, while that's going, uh, I just wanted to give a plug. Um, ever since COVID hit, we started this um, movement uh, called Full Bay Cares, where we wanted to give back uh, to the industry and specifically to ideally to nonprofits that benefit the industry. And one that we've supported several times is a group called Truckers Final Mile. And um, we were talking early on about fatalities on the road. So every day, every day about 11 people die um, in accidents related to commercial vehicles on the road. And about two of those are drivers. And then more than more drivers die just from natural causes when they're out on the road far away from families. So this nonprofit, and amazingly enough, a lot of trucking companies do not do much, if at all, to bring the person home if they're sick or injured or if they passed away. So Truckers Final Mile steps in and does that for the family or brings the family to them. It's a great cause. Uh, we've donated uh, many times, and every sign up this month will make a contribution to Truckers Final Mile, and that's a great, uh, great cause to support. And if you'd like a demo, obviously say yes there. And uh, Jimmy and Luke, we really appreciate your time. You guys are just these treasure troves of inf information and knowledge and wisdom, and we'd love to do this again. Thanks for coming out and speaking with us. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you.